Welcome to the Wild Physio Podcast with your host, Andrew Wild. It's been a few months, but I'm back and I've got Justin Richardson on again, and he's the head of sports rehabilitation at Athletes Authority, and he's currently studying a Master's of High Performance Sport at UTS. He's also an ASCA Level 2 Strength and Conditioning Coach. A huge welcome back to Justin Richardson. How are you, mate? Oh, I'm good. I'm probably just like the rest of the world at the moment, keen to get out of the house. But uh, no, it's good to be back. Thanks for having me, Wildy. And uh, thanks for the, the introduction. Uh, sometimes I tend to forget some of the things that I, that I torture myself through. Don't know why I'm still doing uni, but here we, here we sit. Well, it's great that you're uh, furthering your studies. Uh, I'm, I'm not, probably not at that stage and I'm not willing to go down that route at any time soon. I'm too busy, but um, good on you for doing it. Now I'm going to hit you with some yes, no, or maybe questions to start with. <laughs> Here we go. I'm excited. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. All right. If your rehab professional doesn't witness some of your rehab running, especially your first few sessions during your ACL reconstruction rehab, should you find a new rehab professional? Yes. If you want to continue playing sport post-op ACL reconstructive surgery, even after you have returned to sport, should you never stop performing strengthening, plyometrics, sprinting, etc.? Yes. Do rehab clinicians load ACL patients too early in rehab? Uh, sometimes, yes. Sometimes I feel we load them uh, poorly too early. Uh, which then leads to them being chronically underloaded into the later stages of rehab. Okay, so we'll answer it with a maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Are patients typically underloaded during ACL reconstructive rehab? And you've pretty much already answered that. Yes, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how about this one? Are patients discharged too soon post op ACL reconstructive surgery? Absolutely, yes. Should you wait a minimum of nine months before you return to sport post-op ACL reconstructive surgery? Maybe. Good, we'll touch on that. Should all ACLR clients perform plyos? Yes, in their level of competency, asterisk mark. <laughs> well done, that's it, <laughs> done. There we go. All right. There is, uh, there's part two of the podcast. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> I like those. I like that. Uh, that question is a bit of a fun way to kick things off. Yeah. Sucks the viewers in. So if you're sucked in, the reason why I did it is now you're going to listen to the rest of it. So <laughs> All well, right. it's better than starting with these massive backstories that just go on and on and on. Yeah, so, exactly. yeah. Anyway, let's get into it. All right. So the first question you answered, Yes. If your rehab professional doesn't witness some of your rehab running during your rehab, you should find a new professional. Why did you say yes? Uh, great question. The main reason and the back end of that question is particularly the early stages of rehab running. I actually think that the later stages of the rehab running are far more important to witness. However, you, you should be there throughout the whole journey because you'll you'll get an idea about a, what is the athlete's tolerance to the volumes and intensities that you set for the athlete. And that depends on uh, your rehab running system. Now that can vary depending on where you're at. And for people that have worked in sporting environments, typically they go through something like a level one, two, and three. You can expand upon that and have more extensive and intensive versions of those uh, particular, let's call them running levels. The um, That's something that we particularly use, but what I find is that people typically, if you've done the pre-run phase, the pre-run phase journey well, they won't have too many issues in those first entry periods of returning to run where they will start to develop issues is when they're primarily needing to rely on an increased rate of force development, whether that be through uh, increased max velocity in their in their running or when they're starting to edge towards change direction based tasks and something that i'm a big believer in um, this is just personal opinion so for any evidence-based practitioners that tell me to shut up you can tell me to shut up but i see a lot of people will go from slow straight line running to 
uh, slow curvy linear running to then change direction. I, I don't actually think the slow curved running really bridges any gaps at all. Um, I think that we need to be developing change of direction patterns in isolated tasks far earlier than we do, but that's where athletes will tend to start to run into troubles. Their strategies will either um, highlight that they're not confident in changing direction or that they're, let, I'd call it an inefficient mover in change of direction. And something that, again, it's the more people that I see go through this process, the less uh, certainty I have about my answers in regards to well, what, what is good change of direction mechanics. Should we be avoiding uh, valgus in these positions that load the ACL highly? Look, you can make an argument to say that in, an, in a sporting environment that perfect biomechanics doesn't exist and people will get themselves into nasty situations regardless. However, I think that once an athlete has suffered this injury, we need to um, we need to establish that they can move efficiently when we tell them to move efficiently because if they move inefficiently when we're asking them to move efficiently, then they're definitely going to be poor movers when they have no idea what they're doing out on the field. So in regards to the curved running, why aren't you putting the curved running in? If you can just break that down. Yeah, I just don't know if it really adds anything to my program. And this is something that like, it's a problem with the rehabilitation industry in general, where we, we add so much to our programs and it's hard, right? Like say if we're, if we're taking an athlete back uh, from an ACL reconstruction, we've got to restore local tissue capacity. We've got to make sure that their non-dominant limb uh, stays up to speed as we're, as we're going through that, that big journey, we've got to make sure that their trunk strength, is tip top. We've got to maintain their upper body strength. We've got to maintain their conditioning levels. There's a lot for us to work on, but that sometimes can lead us to just adding things for the sake of adding things where we've really got to challenge ourselves to think is, are the drills that I'm doing, are the um, run prescriptions that I'm giving my athlete, are they actually making a meaningful difference? Um, are they adding volume? Are they improving technical competency? Are they improving size? psychological um, psychological confidence or is it just a filler for the sake of being a filler now for me curved linear running um, is a increase in complexity on linear based running at high speeds that is that when you are uh, when we see in mainly field based sports for athletes that run into trouble it's typically not when they've say for example taken an intercept and they're running in a straight line down the field they typically have some form of uh, curve or some sort of slight uh, change in axel or decel that then they run into soft tissue injury problems. That's obviously not going to occur when they're running at incredibly slow speeds. So if you're including that curve linear running, you're not in, you're not increasing the athlete's capacity to do curve linear running when they're back out on the field, but you're also not increasing an athlete's capacity to change direction because they're never actually changing direction. So I feel like it's you're stuck in this no man's land of I'm not increasing that curve linear capacity, but I'm also not increasing their change of direction ability. So it just becomes something to add in for the sake of adding. So are you saying that the straight line running should turn into straight line sprinting as soon as possible? And you're also integrating change of direction in as, as soon as possible. And to answer that question further, at what stage are you adding in the change of direction in terms of either months or when they're competent or what type of things you're looking for? Yeah. So I guess to answer your question is that I think that we should be working on increasing their, uh, their linear uh, meters per second or linear velocity first to the point where they like, so it depends on the person in front of you, right? Like some people are going to be very fast athletes and because they have a higher pre-injury max velocity it's going to take longer to get to their pre-injury max velocity taking a full back to that is going to be quicker than taking a prop forward to that um, but we should be aiming to get them to quite a reasonable uh, max velocity first um, before we introduce curved linear running and then during that process i like to integrate the change direction demands once they've equipped themselves with enough volume under their Belt. Now you can measure volume in different ways. Ways that we measure it is obviously 
the total volume uh, per session. So we start out looking at like, again, you can pick an arbitrary number as long as it's, it makes sense in a ballpark figure. We start athletes at around sort of a thousand meters a session. And then once we can sort of build them up to around that sort of two or 3000 meters a session, usually that takes about four weeks or for us, they've got to get through uh, two exposures of their um, level one, level two uh, runs in both their extensive and intensive versions. So it takes about a month for us to then be like, okay, this athlete has done enough running and enough drilling and keeping in mind that in tandem with this, they're increasing their uh, plyometric demands in the gym. So they've done enough of those tasks for me to be confident that they're going to handle basic um, axial, decel, and some change of direction work. And again, for us, it's the, the starting point is to have a drill where you're not exactly asking them to perform an aggressive cut, but you're just exposing them to the component of changing velocity, decelerating, and then having some element of moving from the sagittal plane to the frontal plane. And in terms of drills, what are you typically going for when you're starting to integrate some of that change of direction? So something that we'll use is, I mean, again, everybody loves an alphabet drill with change of, with plans, change of direction. We'll typically use something uh, like an H drill where an athlete will run uh, forwards a preset distance, then they will decel, run backwards a preset distance, laterally shuffle um, a preset distance and then go forwards, backwards, and then repeat. The beauty about that is that because there is the component of the um, decel component and then going into the back pedal before they go into that, that actual true change of direction moment. Um, it's quite self-limiting. So if somebody doesn't want to do it, whether that be from a psychological point of view or a physical point of view, um, they will just reduce, they will reduce their intensity. It's not like they can get that wrong, but also say, for example, if I'm changing direction to my right, and my, for the sake of this example, my left knee is my reconstructed knee. It's very hard to laterally shuffle to my right by not pushing off my left foot versus if you cut, if you go straight to say a 45 degree cut or a wide drill, an athlete can um, arc around and they can cheat. They can cheat that. So you, you need to develop the athlete's ability to actually push off their reconstructed leg before you start getting them into more aggressive cuts. So placing them in environments where they physically can't cheat, um, it's that old adage of constraints-based learning. Like the con constraints don't have to be aquabags, hurdles, and bloody tennis balls in their mouths. Like you can just have a drill where they physically don't have a choice other than to use that limb. And if they do it at a slow velocity, that's fine. That's just their starting point. So a good place to start is definitely an acceleration, deceleration, right. and a lateral shuffle type of drill. Yeah, I would say so. Um, or anything where you, you're getting them to move from a more sagittal plane movement to a frontal plane movement yep. rather than having to cut into sagittal, sagittal. Yeah. So a H, a box, something like that, that works. Well. Absolutely. Yeah. That's something that, that's another one that we utilize a lot. Box drills where yep. they're, they're literally, they're facing, facing up the whole way. They go forwards, laterally shuffle, backwards, and then they stop. Yeah. I completely agree. I think that's a great place to start. And it's definitely sort of bridging that gap between obviously running in a straight line and then going to more of your 45 degree cut. Once you've gotten through some of that um, change of direction and the acceleration, deceleration box and H or something like that, you're going now into more of your 45 degree cut. Is that typically where you go from there? Yeah. So from there, where we would then move into is more of what people could classify as something like a, a Z run. Yeah. Um, again, because so I guess that's probably closer to like a 90 degree or maybe 60 degree than say a true 45, because again, they, it is pretty self-limiting that if you give the athlete the cue that they have to change direction around the cones, it has this element where they have to slow themselves down before they have that change of direction moment. And really that's what we're, we're wanting, at least personally, my view is that if when I'm then shifting an athlete past that to a 45 degree cut a wide drill and then ultimately when you're getting into really hard 90 degree cuts 180 degree cuts like your 505s you do want them to have an element of decelerating into the 
into the drill or that cut moment so then they can accelerate out of the cut like at the end of the day if they're if they're just sprinting the whole way through it's not going to be an it's not going to be an effective cut because what's the purpose of change of direction it's typically to try to get around the defender and it's pretty hard to it's pretty hard to have two directions to um to go to if you're constantly moving at your top speed like you need to actually slow yourself down so it, it's more about increasing the demand of the drill but still allowing promoting that environment where they have to decel before they cut yeah and you're often using cones to make sure that they are decelling rather than just saying run and you know put two cones 30 meters apart and i want you to just do a zigzag yeah so we'll try to be again because we're trying to we're doing our best in the environment like sometimes we'll have people that use gps but otherwise we've we've got estimations of our total volume based on um, how far the the drill is so say if we've set up a z drill it will have an example would be it is a 30 meter z with cones one and a half meters apart and they're cutting every five meters so that means that there is um, about 10 cones and then we've got a measuring wheel one and a half meters apart. So we, we estimate, okay, how much lateral distance are they covering per rep? How much um, vertical distance are they covering per, per rep? It's not perfect, but you're going to get more consistent measures than if you just have two cones, one at the start, one at the end, and you're asking them to then change direction whenever they feel like it. Um, the other aspect, sometimes what I might add is I might actually add a pole if somebody is just, retarded and they can't seem to get the cue Mate, you can't say that word you're not allowed to say that word. <laughs> sorry if so if i'm not going to edit uh, it as well remember this is raw uh, well it, it is what it is <laughs> if somebody can't understand the cue of changing direction outside the cones then you put something there that if they don't do it it hits them in the face so like sometimes i use poles um I usually hope that i don't have to get to that point you, um, could, hit, you could hit them with a pool noodle <laughs> uh, so look, there are there are some people that i wish i could have hit with a pool noodle um but again like that's something like i mean it probably goes into a bit more of a philosophical point that some people would just not be great change of di- like change of direction movers and particularly in this sub elite bracket of population groups is that you will be able to train some people to be good movers and some people you just won't be able to train to be good movers. So you've just got to use your clinical reasoning to understand, well, what is the, what is the ceiling of the person in front of me? Yeah. And am I flogging a dead horse trying to get them all to become Roger Tua Varsashek? Yeah. And the other thing is you don't have to be perfect. You know, I think people are too involved with trying to get the perfect cut or the perfect running technique. You know, you don't have to be perfect. Um, you got to get the load and the stimulus under the athlete's belt somehow. And, you know, as you said, if someone just doesn't have the mechanics, they're not very coordinated, you're going to be just flogging yourself for months and months trying to get the person to look better biomechanically, aren't you? Oh, absolutely. And something that I'm a big believer in is that if an athlete is nailing the drill that I'm doing with them perfectly every single time, then it's probably not hard enough for them. Like, for me, all of these drills are, they're almost like screening processes in terms of you, you, or you kind of want to uncover um, like frailties in movement or weird strategies, because if you uncover it there, then you can be almost certain that it's going to come back out on the field. And like, you, you're never wanting to, it's like something that sort of hit home with me and you don't take it literally but it was um, an old mentor of mine that said, like, I would rather break an athlete in a session with me than have them go back out on the field and break out there. Now, you don't want to break someone, but you need to be exposing as many problems as possible. So then you give yourself the opportunity to fix the problems. Yeah, for sure. And sometimes it's finding a needle in a haystack. But yes, I agree. Now, when should you start running after the operation? So this is a bit of a contentious topic. Um, Are there certain parameters that you are sort of making sure that they're hitting before you're starting them on a running journey? Yeah, well, this would be a good one to, uh, to have been on your old little surgeon uh, round table with, because I feel like we would have very differing opinions. Um, I mean, uh, I'm lucky, uh, I'm lucky enough that most of the surgeons that I deal with, if they say that an athlete's happy to return to run and I say that I don't think that they're ready, they'll typically turn around and go, right, that's fine just run when just just get them to run when you think that they're ready but 
I still I still hear a lot of, of this, I'll call it 12 weeks rubbish because I think it is rubbish, particularly in this sub elite space, um, is that mo- majority of people have not gained enough physical competency by that point to have been able to competently return to run and be confident that no issues are going to ri- uh, arise. And I don't know why we're obsessed with running as early as we are, given that the journey, the start to finish journey from a rehab running point of view is not as long as people think it is. If say, for example, if you're starting at three months, it's, it doesn't take, it doesn't take six to nine months to go through a rehab running process and get someone back to team training. Like that's only mm-hmm. like a three, a three month process. Normally um, I would rather wait I'd rather wait more time and make sure my athlete is stronger, make sure that their knee is happier um, to make sure that when they do return to run, I'm not taking two steps forward, going one step back. So if we go extend into what are the competencies that I want an athlete to have, the number one rule, which overarches everything else is they can't have an effusion. And that's probably something that um, I would get, I would be agreed upon amongst the, the surgeon community is that, um, and I'll, knee with I'll, effusion. I'll say, I'll say one thing about that. So yes, I, I agree. But at the same time, often with an ACL client, no matter what you do, they will have a really slight effusion for a very long time. So now, uh, so I you might have... you you might get you might get through say four or five months, and they've still got that slight effusion. And when they overload it a little bit, or they start running they get a little bit of an infusion. You know, are we babying these clients a little bit too much waiting for the effusion to dissipate? Because I have a lot of clients that get to 12, 14, 16, 18 weeks, and they've still got, or even 20 weeks, and they've still got a little effusion. Should we still wait and wait and wait and wait until that effusion's gone? So I will take, I take you point and i think that we can use clinical judgment if there's a trace anything higher than a trace effusion is a no-go absolute no-go for me and for the for the listeners can you just define trace versus something that is more mild moderate etc uh so trace would be if we're using so typically i'll use the a brush swipe test is that um on the swipe away, there's obviously there's no spontaneous refill and there's a very small little pocket of fluid when you brush back that comes back. Um, above that, a one is that there's no spontaneous refill, but there's a bigger bulge. A two is there is spontaneous refill. And then a three is that you can't even move it away. Yeah. Um, and, and some so, people, just for the um, the new grads out there, you can use sort of your, your trace, your mild, your moderate, your severe or gross or whatever. But yeah, that, that system, what you just said is great as well, where it's more of your, your one, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's all the, it's all the same. It's just different, different names. So I think we can use clinical judgment when there's a trace present, but I think that's where something that we can be better at as clinicians is understanding the pathophysiology of the original injury, depending on when that happened, particularly if it's someone that's had an early ACL reconstruction, because if somebody has had um, an early ACL recon, and if it's just an isolated ACL injury, nothing else going on, they are more inclined to probably be a little bit more aggressive, both in the pre, pre-run phase, um, in terms of getting them back into gate mechanics drills, um, plyometric based drills, not true plyometrics, but on the plyometric continuum. Um, and then if they have a small trace of fusion, I'm like, yeah, that's, I'm pretty, I'm pretty fine with that. If they've suffered a significant amount of subchondral bone bruising, again, I saw how I think is I, I try to put my sort of MRI vision goggles on and think that, um, I do, if they've got an effusion, I, I tend to be a little bit more conservative with them just because I want to give that subchondral bone a chance to settle down. Because um, again, something that I'm starting to, that I've recognized more and more, the more people that I see in this space is the chondral and subchondral injuries suck. And if you don't get them right, uh, they will pester and linger around for a long period of time. So I think like as a golden principle, 
Um, if you're a clinician that's dealing with an ACL reconstruction, you absolutely need to hunt down the MRI pictures. I know this is going off topic a little bit, but we need to hunt down the MRI pictures. We need to understand, we need to go through the op report. Again, um, if someone's had a lateral meniscectomy, they will more than likely than not have more effusion than people that haven't had a lateral meniscectomy. So just understanding the injury that you're dealing with it, like not all ACL reconstructions are made equal. Yes. Um, so that's a really important one in regards to effusion. But then on the flip side, like there's those people that it might be their third ACL recon. They've had multiple <laughs> meniscectomies through their time. They've had um, the, their chondral surfaces aren't fantastic and the subchondral bone does not is not to be desired. They may have like a persistent trace to one plus effusion, as you said, no matter what you do. So then you've yeah. got to use your clinical judgment being like, am I just, am I holding this person off running forever? Probably not. Their knee's not exactly uh, textbook <laughs> anyway, anymore. Um, so in that instance, it's about monitoring changes in effusion. If, they, if their normal effusion level is a one, do you do your first run and it blows up to a three? Well, you've probably done something wrong there. Yes. Um, well, maybe you haven't done something wrong, but they just haven't tolerated it. Versus <laughs> if, they're, if they're normally a one and then they're, after they're running, they're still a one, then you're, you're pretty on the money there. So that's that big explanation about effusion. The other ones would be, I want them to have, again, as a base rule, there are exceptions based on the weird and wonderful things that happen to some of these people. I want full range of motion, particularly into extension. Um, I want at least 80% limb symmetry index on quads and hamstrings. And that's with uh, dynamometry, or if you can get them to an isokinetics uh, machine, that would be fantastic. But otherwise, like I just use a handheld dyno on a, on a leg extension machine that's loaded up with plates. So it's a fixed arm. Um, and then I, we use our Nord board isometrically. Again, if you can find a way to use your dyno so at least one end is fixed, then you'll increase your reliability. Um, I want at least 90% uh, limb symmetry on capacity testing. So for capacity testing, that's how do we then convert isolated muscle strength into a more dynamic task that requires multiple muscle groups. So single leg squat, single leg hamstring bridge, single leg calf raise. Uh, my big three and then look we use we we're lucky enough to have the force plates with us if you don't have the force plates i would encourage you to download the my jump 2 app to be able to measure height of of jumps um it's not that expensive in the grand scheme of things uh, i want at least 70 percent limb symmetry on a single leg counter movement jump so vertical jump um and then i want the athlete to be able to perform 20 single leg pogos in a row and be competent in basic landing and gait mechanics drills. So it's a little, little list, but you, you sort of piece it all together. It's not like, for example, if someone can't do an, an A skip well, but they're ticking everything else off. Like, I think we've got to be like exit criteria. Yes. We, we, in a perfect world, it's black and white, but in reality, it is this shade of gray that we, we have to piece it all together and go, right, okay, is this the right decision for the right person at that time? If someone's an absolute freak and they nail that very early, what's the earliest stage you will get someone to run post-op? The earliest I've gotten somebody to run post-op is about 10 weeks. And that's just because I nobody's been able to hit those markers before then. Um, or maybe I'm, maybe I'm just not very good at my job. Um, no, but... <laughs> I agree. I, I, I think that, I think that is a logical time frame for someone that is highly advanced. Cause we think if you're going into more of that six to eight weeks, you know, the, the graft is not that stable then, well, it's not very matured. I suppose that's a better way of putting it. It's at its weakest point. Um, so it doesn't really make sense to go under 10 in my opinion. What do you think? Oh, I mean, I would agree. And I mean, like, again, depends on who you're working with. We're seeing more um, <laughs> different uh, surgeons are getting, trying new and wonderful things to increase the success rate of their surgery. So I'm seeing, for some surgeons, seeing more people come out without bracing on. I'm seeing some people come out with bracing on. But mm -hmm. say if someone's in a brace for six to eight weeks, then like, you got no chance of getting it. I just automatically move their expectations to being more four to five months rather than three months because they've been stuck in a brace for such a long period of time. But um, we've also got to understand that 
as much as the graft maturity is important is that the fact that they've got had a big drill pummeled into their femur and their <laughs> tibia that acts almost like a subchondral bone injury. So we need to, need to, we need to let things heal. And like, I think we've, we can never forget that in our, in our job. And I think that like with this rise of the sort of the hybrid physio and strength and conditioning principles coming into physio, I think like the danger is letting that, mindset take over what is traditionally been our bread and butter which is anatomy physiology understanding of injury yeah for sure and for the listeners out there that have undergone an acl reconstruction recently if they get to a four or five month mark and they still haven't run they shouldn't freak out they've still no got time way. they've still got time don't they i think people are way too you know black and white with oh, 12 weeks you got to be running but as you said, a running program really shouldn't last. It doesn't need to last a crazy amount of time. Well, the other thing that I think people forget is that the success of an ACL reconstruction isn't them returning to play, isn't their return to play time. It's them still playing in two, three, four, five, ten 10 years time. Agreed. And, and having not re-injured themselves. So it, it's honestly, it, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, for sure. And in terms of change of direction, when is the earliest you're going to get someone to typically start changing direction? If, say, for instance, you had an absolute freak athlete that starts running at 10 weeks and they're flying along, when when would be the earliest? Well, just following our systems and protocols, so let's say if, if someone had run it, started running at 10 weeks, it, like it, it takes them four weeks minimum to get through our level one and level two and we start change direction at level three so it'd be 14 weeks for for them so it's it's building up a good month of linear volume before they actually start that change direction work but the like the caveat with that is that they're still doing change of direction they're still doing frontal plane and multi-planar work in their run drilling so it's just about that combination of going from a sagittal plane to frontal plane or to a a combination plane movement So you don't think that people should be waiting until sort of four and a half, five months until they start to do more aggressive change of direction or cutting? I don't think so. Not in a not in a planned environment. Like, I mean, I'm not I'm not 70 years old and haven't been practicing for 50 years. So, but I still haven't seen someone uh, tear their ACL or tear their graft in a planned change of direction environment. Especially um, when it's not, and, especially when it's not quick. No, and yeah. even yeah. So, and like the trade of that is that even though I, like I haven't been practicing for fifty years, like we'd probably see like it's at least personally would see over a hundred ACLs a year through the facility that we've got at the moment. So we, we're starting to pick up more and more trends of what are the problems these people face and what are the things that are like spoken about too much when we shouldn't speak about them at all yeah yeah for sure now in terms of return to training so this is a really big one i wanted to go through this when is it appropriate for someone to return to training and how do you know that they're ready this is a huge one especially for the new grads out there you know that they'll probably see an acl client and they'll be like when the hell are they good to go yeah well that's a that's a it's a bit of a loaded question in the sense that there's probably a number of things that you want to be looking at. You want to be looking at an athlete's uh, strength profile in the gym, their power profile in the gym, as well as what do their field requirements uh, look like. So there's a number of different things. And that's what, like, during this whole process, it it is hard because we're, we're needing to progress them in so many different areas. So to run through uh, sort of what I look for for return to team training. That would be where I'm wanting above that. Uh, and again, the, the context with all of this is that for me, return to team training, their first month of return to team training is just physical conditioning drills. So it's it's not even them doing like skill work or anything like that. It's just I'm comfortable for you to be in that environment where I'm not there looking after you anymore. Um, so for me, I want them to have, limb symmetry on quads and hamstrings. Um, Is that again with the dynamometer typically using or? Yeah. I mean, again, at this point, I'd really like them to have isokinetic testing. um, If they've got available to you, like 
being and in if North you do, Sydney. And if you don't have it available, should you go and find it? If you can. Like, I mean, if you can't, if, you, if you're based in Broken Hill and the closest isokinetic machine is six hours away, that's probably going to be hard. But, like, for, for us, we know another place in North Sydney that has one of those machines. So we just send them all there. So, and no, I've run into no issues of any athlete going, oh, I don't want to pay for that. I just say, I just tell them it is of absolute importance that you get this done. And they're like, okay. And then they go do it. Um, so I'm wanting 85% limb symmetry, quads and hamstrings. Uh, we place a high value on Nordboard testing for eccentric hamstring strength testing. And the reasoning behind that is largely because, and these are um, in part some theories that I'm attempting to expand upon with research is that in Australia, your primary graft of choice is a hamstring graft. Um, historically, based on the literature, hamstring grafts uh, have a higher failure rate than bone patella bone grafts, uh, patella tendon bone grafts. Um, eccentric hamstring strength is a capacity that has massive asymmetries for a long period of time post ACL reconstruction. Um, the hamstrings are theorized to act eccentrically to protect the knee from anterior tibial translation. And eccentric hamstring strength is incredibly hard to test unless you have a Nord board, which most, a lot of places don't have a Nord board. So when we piece all that together and we can, you can make some educated guesses. I won't say conclusions because people will probably shoot me down. But you can have some estimated get educated guesses that there's probably a lot of people with piss weak eccentric hamstring strength that are being returned to sport post hamstring graft. Um, and that's probably a, a big contributor to them re-injuring. And then you ask yourself the question is that are the hamstring grafts actually weaker than the patella tendon grafts? Or do these people just have very poor eccentric hamstring strength capacity? So I can't prove that yet. Uh, but there are some things that we're looking into more. So we'll value the Nord board strength testing. Um, I want at that point in time, between 95 and 105% limb symmetry on capacity-based testing. Now I have that uh, range rather than just going, oh, it should be 100 because an athlete could vary one or two reps either side on their leg based upon how they wake up that day. And I know that there's a lot of hate against limb symmetry at the moment saying, oh, the non-dominated leg is not a good marker. It's like, well, why shouldn't it be? If it's not a good marker, then you've done a very bad job in the time that you've had this person with the non-dominated leg. So if you're confident in your practices that you've done a good job at keeping that non-dominant leg strong um, or non-injured leg strong, sorry, then it shouldn't be a problem. It would so, be nice. It would uh, be nice if we had our pre-injury data to compare it to. Yes. But that, that, that is very unusual to have. It is unusual, unless obviously you're you're in a system where you're dealing with athletes that aren't injured and then they yeah. get injured. Uh, but I mean, ultimately, you hope that the ones that if you're working with them that aren't injured, you hope that they stay not injured. Um, so yes, pre-injury data would be perfect, but we don't live in a perfect world, unfortunately. So that's where I think limb symmetry index can be a good mark. It can be a good marker or a bad marker. It's a good marker if you're actually work like if you're challenging the non-operated limb, it's not a good marker if you're letting that decondition. So mm. if, if the tide is rising, then it's a good marker. If the tide is going out, then it's not a good marker. Um, so from a strength perspective, what have we done? We've done isokinetics, we've done Nord board, we've done, um, we've done limb symmetry on capacity-based testing. So that really na nails down. I don't really look at... Um, one rep maxes uh, and i think this probably goes into a bigger point where if you're actually watching your client or your athlete in the gym you'll get a you'll, you'll get to understand a you should probably know what their one rep max um, estimation is anyway but you get to know if they're lifting well or not um, versus taking all this time to do a one rep max test which they they probably won't be able to perfect anyway because they're not power lifters um, so they're probably the big three for strength for power, same deal. I want that limb symmetry at, at, at least 85% for your um, single leg counter movement jump for a single leg drop jump for a double, uh, for a double leg drop jump. I, I, deal, I don't actually base any decision-making on their reactive strength on a double leg drop jump. But one thing that I will educate 
the people that I have with with me is that less plyom- like less athletic and less plyometric plyometric individuals get injured more than more athletic and more plyometric individuals. So I just want that number to be as high as possible. Um, and then for my horizontal hop testing, I want at least 85% limb symmetry on a single leg hop, hop and stick, triple hop, triple crossover hop, and a timed 40-30 lateral hop. Um, yep. And then on those testing, I, I care more about the landing than I actually care about the distances. The, the total distances aren't huge to me. Um, it's more about their ability, again, to produce and absorb force. Like what's their strategy and how they get from point A to point B. Um, so that's the power component. And then from a field component, it's hard because you're not always going to know what the person did in their sport pre-injury but you, if you can have an idea about what their pre-injury match demands were if you can get them to about 80 percent of that with you i.e like we're talking a field sport athlete that maybe might do like you know, seven k's a game if you can get them to a point where they were doing five k's in a session with you then you're and they're getting through that well then you're on a money winner if you can get them to at least uh six meters per second max velocity you're on a money winner uh, that's typically where we start to get into that sort of high speed run threshold for a field sport athlete. Um, and then if you can accumulate at least 200 meters of high speed, high speed running above that six meters a second per week for at least four weeks, then you, you, you're building, you're building this picture in your head that the athlete is in a pretty good position to then return to team training. And then for, again, for me, that's just to start physical conditioning drills with their team. It's like, okay, we, you can probably dial down your, work with me and start to dial up your work with your team so once you're at the team training are you starting with some just basic closed drills and then you're transitioning slowly into open drills or how does your framework work yeah so i'll get them for me i like to have a process where it's around the three month uh return to training process where i get them doing just the physical conditioning drills whether that's speed drills fitness drills um, so pre-planned and maybe some, depending on what the reactive drills is, I'll get them to, I'll get them to discuss it with me first. Um, but nothing with involving a ball or actual skills for the first month, then I will integrate them into closed skills. So ball in hand, but not really very reactive, just working on refinement of technique for two weeks, open skills for two weeks so that's where it does become a little bit more uh, random and um, reactive then small sided game work for at least two weeks and again the caveat with that is that this is for at least this period of time um, and then full team training for a month before returning to play so this is where if you outline this system we you can build this nice gradual progression where you can be comfortable returning someone to team training at say six months knowing that they're going to finish that process at at least nine months and it may take them a bit longer but at least they're back with their team versus just going you, you're hesitant to return them to training and then it suddenly gets to eight months and you're like oh, okay go back to training and then they go oh i feel i'm feeling ready but then they haven't done really what you want them to do and you go oh, okay just get four weeks of training in and then they're back out and that and they're really that they've really condensed that versus if we can make this process gradual then I think we will be exposing them to more change of direction movements, more reactive movements, more skill-based tasks, and then they can be more confident athletes. Um, we can't uh, we can't be we can't say say with any certainty that they're not going to hurt hurt themselves, but we can put ourselves in the best possible position that they won't hurt themselves. Yeah, mate, it's a great framework, and it frustrates me when a lot of physios of potentially in the past or even now still are getting people to nine months and just saying off you go or testing them and they get through some testing like we just discussed and they say off you go. So yeah, I agree that it needs to be a gradual return. And if you pass that testing, it is a return to training test. And then from there, you've got to build up in competency at training to obviously return to games. Now, this is my last question. It's been great so far, mate. Well done. Um, One question. This is a little bit left field. 
ACL rehab takes a bloody long time and it's bloody expensive. How do you go about working with someone that doesn't have the money to see you very often? That's a, that's a, well, that's a tricky one. I guess living in a capitalist world, money, um, money gets you further than not having money. Um, for us, we look at having a model that incentivizes uh, athlete attendance, which means that we just have one fee per, per week or athletes can pay it in whatever interval that they want. And that means that they get unlimited access to us. Now that works for the system that we have based on the staffing we have and the structures that we have. But I think that if you, if you can't, if you're, if you're not in that position, because a lot of people aren't going to be in that position where A, they have gym, big gyms for athletes to work in and um, these teams around you where obviously from a business point of view, the, um, the advantage is, is that they obviously pay probably higher than what a normal consult fee is, but then they get access to more things. Um, but it means that I can take more people on because I'm not having to see them as much. So, but we'll take the business things aside. I would say that if you can set your systems of programming up, i.e. you've got a good uh, programming system where you're not having to spend heaps of time uh, writing them a gym program, where you have a, a rehab running system in place where you can just give it to them, um, where you've got a return to training uh, system in place where it, it's all already mapped out and it's, it's more work for you on the front end um, but it will help you provide better outcomes on the back end because the problem that I feel that most physios run into is that they try to squeeze everything into the 40 minutes that they have with the client. And then the moment they're out the door, they forget about them until they step back in the door where you just can't write up the world's best gym program, speed program, um, conditioning program, return to training process in 40 minutes. Whereas if you spend a bit of time and maybe it requires doing an Excel course so you can know how to make some spreadsheets where if you can spend the time at home or whenever you've got some sort of uh, self-professional development time, working on some systems for you to be better at having a, uh, having a program for them to do, then the only barrier that you're leaving for them is patient compliance. And I mean, that, that is a big barrier when they're not, physically in front of you and that's probably one thing that's one of the reasons that we built our model the way that it is is that the athletes only have to get through the door we do the rest versus the in another environment if for example you don't get to have much touch points with them then they will get less support but i feel like the more value that you can add to a person then the better outcome you're going to be but be creative like can you is there a park near where your clinic is and can yeah. you create some rehab running sessions. Like it doesn't have to be perfect to start with. Like you don't have to have the world's most individualized um, running programs or anything. You can just have a, like just by writing out a level one, two and three rehab run and having some rehab running groups, you're already in probably the top 15% of sports rehab physios in the private sector in this country, which isn't a good thing to say, but it's like, it's not hard to be better than the rest. And just by starting, you will want to improve your systems, like because you won't be satisfied with it. You'll never be satisfied with it once you start trying to improve what you can add value to your to your athletes. Yeah, I completely agree. And if you're going to go with, you know, that more that sort of holistic framework, like you're discussing there, you need to put in the time and the effort. You know, an ACL patient takes time you know, on the back end to obviously optimize their rehab, you know, you need to be writing the rehab programs, the running programs, everything. It, it does take a lot of time. So you need to invest the time because they're going to get a better outcome if you invest the time. And I completely agree. I wrote this yesterday on my Instagram. If you're going to go and take a client through the ACL plan, you need to take them to the bloody park. Like you can't just tell them to off they go and do their rehab running because they'll half ass it so you need to go to the park and you need to be a bit of a forward thinker and make sure that you take the time out of your day to you know go down to the park find a park nearby and away you go well the problem is is that most people particularly young physios will step out of uni and they'll go into an environment where 
the system to rehabilitate all injuries is the same. For all yeah. injuries, it's a 60-minute initial, if you're lucky. Sometimes it's a 40-minute initial and a 20-minute follow-up. And people with an ACL injury require very different support to somebody that has had, and this is not to discredit any of these other injuries, but somebody that's had a grade one ATFL or a, a, an acute low back flare up or something like that. Like, again, not to discredit that, but there are certain injuries that don't require as much support. Um, and there are certain injuries that require lots of support. <laughs> yeah. Amen to that, mate. Completely agree. I think that'll do us. I think that's been going about 45 minutes or so. I think we, we said 30 to 40. Yeah. <laughs> We well, we kept it under an hour, so that's a that's a good that's a good improvement. Hopefully, yeah, exactly. more people are still listening compared to last time. There's uh there's plenty of other stuff that I'd love to go through. So why don't we uh we'll lock in a three at some point in the next three or four months. <laughs> yes, sounds good. It can be uh launch into 2022. Sounds yeah. great, mate. Well, thanks so much for your time. Where can all the listeners find you? Instagram, all that stuff, because your Instagram you do some good. Good stuff. You're obviously a bit of a genius on Canva. Good, good work. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I, mean, I, I need to get some tips. No, I can't be bothered. There's too much time and effort. It looks, but, it looks very professional though. Well done, mate. If you want Canva tips, you go. To, buddy, Lockie Wilmot has bloody shares in Canva. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, right. But um, once, once I bought, once I paid for Canva Pro, which actually I'd probably recommend for people. It's, it's a pretty easy platform to use. Um, uh, <laughs> I thought I better start putting some effort in. I'm creeping closer to the. Uh, 10k mark which is which is a goal so um my instagram handle is at j rehab underscore and that's typically where you would find me the other one is that i've actually launched a website um in the last couple of months which is called www.sportsrehab.physio so you can find me there if you if you want to listen if you want to read some of my blogs awesome all the uh new grads out there students get on top of justin's content it's great so keep it coming mate Good luck trying to uh, fit it all in because creating content takes bloody time. And considering your Canva skills, I have no doubt that the Canva stuff that you're doing at the moment takes a bit of time out of your day. So the people that do follow him, like his stuff, he deserves it. You know, that that would take a lot of time to do each post. So um, give him the props. Thanks, mate. Thanks again. Uh, you can find this podcast on Google, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, all that jazz. Um, and as usual, stay strong.